Now that the base is squared away, I can start finishing up this Star Wars Legion LAAT gunship. <laughs> Now you may remember from the last video in which I worked on this patrol gunship, I had painted it up uh, kind of like the colors shown on the Havoc Marauder, uh, which is the ship featured in the Bad Batch. Uh, I didn't want to try and completely, you know, replicate it, but just something inspired by it. Uh, very dirty, very gritty looking, uh, a little darker than most, most Star Wars ships, and I was pretty happy with, with how it came out. But now I'm going to start doing things like panel lining and streaking and chipping and staining and all sorts of stuff like that. So that's what this will be about. Now to seal in all the paintwork, I use this satin varnish uh, from VMS Products. This is the best satin varnish that I've used. It's an acrylic product. I airbrushed it on and it just works really, really well. So if you're looking for a satin uh, varnish coat, I highly recommend this one. For my panel line wash, I'm going to be using this Abtai Lung 502 or 502 Abtai Lung, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is Starship Filth. It's just a nice dirty brown color uh, that's great for panel lines if you want them to look dirty. And then I'm going to be thinning that partially with this oil expert from VMS because it just speeds up the drying time of the oils. And then I'm going to be using just some plain old Weber's odorless terpenoid to uh, kind of extend that just a little bit. I've thinned the oil here in my palette and I've just got this cheap liner brush that I like applying it with. Now the great thing about this satin finish is it allows the oils to just slide around the details and flow really easy without spreading out like it would be if I had left this the matte paint surface. But when I go back to clean them up, there's going to be just enough grip to hold them in place. And that's especially critical when I'm cleaning up around the raised areas. It doesn't have much trouble staying down in the recesses uh, because you can, you can clean those up fairly easy and just pass right over them. But along these raised details, if you've got a glossy surface, a high gloss surface, when you try and clean up what you don't want there, quite often you end up getting up what you want to remain. Now if you're wanting a really dirty model, you might want to go with just the matte acrylic surface uh, because the paints, the, the oils will spread much more around that and you get a very dirty look and then it allows you to go back and blend it in the more you do it though, the more familiar you'll become with the different benefits of, of each of these finishes and how uh, each you know gloss, satin, and flat react with uh, both oil products and enamel products and acrylic weathering products. Alright, I've got all the panel lining done and now I want to start on the chipping. Now for the chipping, I'm going to go for uh, a two color scheme like I normally do. I don't always do that, but um, I think it'll look good here. I'm going to go for a lighter gray color to start with. So I'm going to use this Vallejo Sky Gray, which uh, should work well with, with this. And I'm going to do brush chipping on this rather than uh, sponge chipping. I often start off with sponge chipping, but I want to have a little more control, so I'm going to use a brush for this. And you can see this is just a really fine uh, brush. It's this is from Army Painter. It's a Wargamer detail brush. They don't they don't give the size, so I don't know whether to tell you it's a you know a five zero or a three zero or a two zero or a one, and it's going to depend on the manufacturer anyway. But I'm just going to go in and I'm going to start doing this chipping. Now I'm going to focus mostly along edges um, because that's that's where it's going to get the damage. It's where it's going to get chipped, especially up here at the front. And you see I'm just kind of lightly stippling on just a little bit of paint at a time. That's the key, I think, to, uh, to brush chipping is just just lightly stippling it on there and letting it build up as you go. Not trying to paint
paint so much as you are just dot the stuff on there. Now I've thinned my paint fairly heavily. Um, it's probably close to two parts water, one part paint. Now you have to be careful not to thin it too much so that it's so um, so thin, so transparent that you can't see the chips and you don't want it runny so that you lose control of it. But by having it in that that thin fashion like that, it really gives you the ability to control the chips much better with this little brush. Now, as a recommendation for workflow, what I recommend is if you're going to do this, that you put in all of your tiny chips first. You, not only your chips, but things like, you know, your, your streaks that you're going to put in places to represent, you know, surface scuffs and things like that. Get all the tiny stuff in first. And then once you have that in, and I'm going to break my rule here just for the sake of demonstration, but once you have all the tiny chips in, then go and look for places to develop larger chips. And you're using the same method. You're just concentrating the stippling around the, the pointillism into a more focused area. And that's where you're going to get just some of your bigger chips. And when I come back later with a darker color, that's where I'm going to focus on in terms of the chipping. Now, I've not completely finished the lighter colored chipping, but for the sake of filming efficiency, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate the darker chipping. Now, often when I'm picking my darker chipping color, I'll get something that's kind of rusty, got a red brown to it, because I'm going to develop maybe a lot of rust tones to it. Or sometimes I'll get something that's more just gray, maybe not neutral gray, but maybe just a little darker than neutral gray. But I wanted to reinforce the idea of these cold tones, even if only in a very subtle way. Well, I started looking up pictures of just steel. And what I started noticing, and I have not noticed this before, but they had a lot of bluish tones to them, kind of a bluish look. Now, maybe it was just reflecting in the light or something like that, but it was across enough pictures that I was convinced it was an thing. So what I did was I started with this basalt gray from Vallejo, which is just a little darker than neutral gray. And then I added in some of this USNC blue. This is from the Vallejo model airline. And what it's given me is here. I'll try and show you. It's given me this dark blue gray and you can also see how much I've thinned it right there. It's given me this, it's a darker gray, but it's got just a hint of blue to it. And I really like the way it looks. Now, like I said, it's in such small quantities, but I think it's going to help contribute to the, I guess you'd say the blue feel of the whole model. Now in some areas where I do streaks like this, some of them I'll leave them just as the, the light gray, but on some of them I'm going to put in either partially or wholly just a bit of a dark line. Now generally if I'm trying to make it look like a scuff that gives some depth, I'll put the darker line on top and leave the lighter line on bottom because that's to simulate reflecting light coming from above. So if you want to think about light reflections, that's that's how I do it. So now I'm going to continue working around the model, putting in both the light and the dark chips to catch the rest of the model up to the way this looks. Now another thing I want to do is I want to put some streaks and grime and stuff like that. I'm going to use this AK Interactive Streaking Grime. I'm going to be using uh, some of this enamel odorless thinner from Ammo of MIG. Is it? Are, are you allowed to use MIG and AK at the same time? I guess so. 
Now what I've done is I've got some of the uh, some of the enamel in my palette here, and then I've got some some of the odorless thinner. You can tell I've already been working on it a little bit. And then I've got a paper towel off to the side. I'll keep that off camera. The way I like to do those is I like to just kind of draw in where I want it to be at about the distance that I want. And you'll notice that this is, this is a very transparent um, uh, product, but I can add more to it just to give it more opacity if I want. And I just go ahead and I put it in there. I'm not trying to do it with any kind of precision. I'm just putting it on there. That's, that's the main thing uh, that I'm going to do there. Now other areas, maybe if I just want some general, like there's something leaking near this and it's kind of collecting here, I can put that in also and just have that ready to go. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to give these a chance to dry up before I start working with them. This here is kind of in a more up and down orientation. But let's say I want to have something maybe right here that's going to indicate that it's a leak while in flight. Because it's going to be streaked back. So what I'll do there is just, again, apply some of the enamel like that in preparation for blending that. Now I need to give this all a few minutes uh, to dry a little bit. And you'll know it's dry because it goes from being gloss to being semi-gloss, kind of a matte look to it. Now to start working that streak right there, what I've done, one, I've oriented the model so that um, I can easily keep it vertical. I have a bad habit. Um, I can't draw straight lines. So I have a bad habit of when I'm doing streaking that it ends up going one way or the other. So I have to orient the model and the brush uh, as best I can to try and uh, to try and keep it vertical. So that's why I've got it at this odd angle. But what I start doing is I take my brush and I've got some thinner on it, and then I damped the thinner off on the paper towel. So there's just a very little bit of thinner, and I just start working outside of it. I'm not actually touching it yet. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. <laughs> and then I just start working in towards it very little bit at a time. Now some of it will pull down. That's okay. I let it go down. And then I can start on the other side. I'll have to orient it the other way. Let me refocus. Now it's a little easier to do this off camera because I'm not having to do it with the camera between me and the subject, but you get the point. And I just start streaking that down. And it's it's right whenever I think it's right. You know, you can streak it so that there's almost nothing left. You can leave it as a fairly thick streak. Um, like I can come down here and I can go across it and cut it off like that. So the enamels are very configurable. Easy to work with. But the idea is to just develop that streak in a way that it achieves the effect that you're looking for. Now, down here, where I've got this, this stain right here, all I'm going to do there is I'm just going to kind of push the stuff back up just a little bit. And here I'm going to be kind of going for the serendipity effect. Whatever happens, happens. I just see what develops and I just work it and stipple it and push the color back up. And you'll notice that I'm working with it. It's quite wet, but I can just go back and forth and decide how I want it to look. Now I can give that thinner time to dry off and see it. Does it leave a tide mark? And if it does, then I can just clean that off. And if it doesn't, um, I can add more to it. I can spread it around more. I can do whatever I need to. I did some of the same stuff up here off camera, and I'm just going to work that in like that. Just let the, let the weathering happen. Sometimes weathering is not so much something we do as it is a process we participate in, because sometimes the materials will do certain things 
and you step back and you look at it and you think, oh, wow, that's, that wasn't what I intended, but that was really cool. And so when that happens, you can, you can run into some really cool, cool stuff that you weren't expecting. So that's the whole process of these streaks and these stains. But oils and enamels are very configurable in that you can do them that way. I could do this with acrylics also, and they would dry really fast. The difference is you have to thin your acrylics down and apply them a little bit at a time and build up the layers of the effect. Because enamels and oils, I've talked about this before. If you watch my videos, you've heard this. You know it's coming. Oils and enamels are a subtractive process. I put the product on and then I take it off. So it's a subtractive process. Acrylics are an additive process. And I'm just, I'm just creating some stains here that I wanted to put in there right now um, while I'm rambling. Acrylics are an additive process. You put them on a little bit at a time and build up the effect. I think the best results are achieved when you work with all three and get comfortable with them and then in your weathering you can pick what's the best tool for the job because I think instead of thinking in terms of I'm going to be streaking or I'm going to be panel lining or I'm going to be chipping what, what I'm doing it's easier to demonstrate these things in simple steps but what I'm doing when I'm actually building a model, if I were building this off camera, I would be thinking in terms of what do I want the overall effect to look like. And I wouldn't think, okay, now I have to add chipping, now I have to add this, now I have to add that. I would think, what do I want the overall effect to look like? And what combination of tools, essentially, uh, products, uh, brushes, thinners, uh, streaking stuff, uh, and techniques combined together is going what is which ones are going to result in that so i don't look at it as look at it necessarily as rote steps but rather as one holistic piece and all of those things added together get me to that expected result next thing i want to do is i want to get this masking off of the canopy and i like using a toothpick to remove the the masking i don't actually put it at the edge but rather I start it a little bit away from the edge and the toothpick will grab that tape and just pull it along and then I can start removing it. The next step will be to use my toothpick again and just find any areas where there may have been some paint that slipped through the tape and I'll just gently scrape that off. Because I used acrylics it makes it fairly easy to do that. And then finally I'm going to use a Q-tip to just gently rub the canopy and any tape residue that's on there will come up. Now the canopy framing goes on right here. I could use white glue to glue this or other modeling specific canopy glues, but those don't always hold as well as I like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of the fact that the framing has terminates right here, the framing that's already molded in. I'm going to scrape any paint off of that and then I'll scrape the paint off where those parts will meet the back of the canopy framing just a few little spots and then on this part of the canopy framing I'll put dots of Tamiya extra thin cement and then I'll hold it aside for a minute and give that cement time to start evaporating it'll it'll soften the plastic but what I'm wanting it to do is when it evaporates mostly so that it won't squish out or anything like that I'm just gonna lightly pop it on here I'm just gonna take it and I'm just gonna put it on and hold it with almost no pressure because I don't want to get any of the uh, any of the glue pushing out from behind there I just want it to get enough contact to, to meld those parts together. Now, in order to see what I'm doing, I'm going to do this off camera, but that's, that's essentially the process I'm going to be taking for this. Now, with this in place, 
where I had scraped the paint off the back of this framing, there's a little bit of bare plastic showing on either side of where it joins to these molded in canopy frames. And I'll just take uh, some of my gray paint and a very small brush and just touch that up. And if you're doing that and you get any paint on the clear part, just go back to your toothpick and scrape that right off. All right, I need to get these doors popped off so that I can glue them in place. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to gently wedge my knife up in there. I don't want the glue to pull away any of the paint, so I'm going to work really gently. Just pull that away. There we go. Now I'll just gently pop this one out. Now what I'll do is, I'll do this off camera, but you can see like right here just a little bit of the trace of the glue and I'll go through and just peel that off very gently and if it starts to pull, if it looks like it's going to pull the paint, then I'll just use a, a damp brush to kind of just wick that away and get that cleaned up. But then I'll be able to glue the doors on in the open position and, uh, and get those ready for display. Now when I'm gluing those on, what I'll do is, once I'm sure of the angle I want to put them at and get them test fitted on there, I'll clean off any paint that's going to be where the glue is going to go. And then that way I can make sure that there's going to be a good, strong, solid bond and that the doors will stay open and not, uh, not hopefully not pop off. All right, well, I think I'm ready to call this guy done. Man, what a fun kit this is. Um, I just can't say enough good about it. I have had such a good time building this. Um, just to cover the, the last steps, uh, I glued these guns on, nothing special, just, just a little glue, glued those on, um, glued these in place. Do this last thing. Make sure you've got everything else done because once these are on, um, it, it, things can be a little difficult to get to. The handling of it is a little difficult. Um, they, they go on perfectly, but just save that for the last. For the doors, um, I glued them on uh, where the hinges are, and I just used Tamiya Extra Thin Cement, but I also put a little glue uh, right here, and I let it touch this this loading ramp or whatever this is. I, uh, I put a little bit of glue right there to give it some extra reinforcement. And then right here where it touches this nacelle looking thing, this, this part right here, I pushed it up so that it's just right against that. So I glued it not only along that edge where it joins the fuselage, but just right there at that point, just to give it some extra strength so that uh, hopefully when I eventually sell this thing and, and ship it, um, and somebody perhaps uses it to play the game, it'll have, have a little more strength. You can see I decided to go ahead and fully open both doors so that um, if somebody wants to examine the inside of it, it's very, very dark in there. You'd really have to get right up to it and uh, probably even shine a light in it, but you'd be able to see the details that are, that are in there. You can't see much of the pilots. I'm, I'm glad I went with that high contrast look because um, even, even right up close, you just kind of see them against the dark background and that's, that's it. Uh, but I was really happy with how this Bad Batch inspired finish turned out. That's that's exactly what I wanted. Um, it's rare that I, I come close to executing on plastic the vision that I have in my head. And uh, and I gotta say, um, I, I I hope it wasn't lightning in a bottle because I I feel like I did it this time. Uh, and I'm. It's it's almost exactly what I envisioned, so I'm uh, I'm pretty happy with that, and that's <laughs> that's a rare thing for me. So so uh, this has been really enjoyable. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this video, and hopefully for this video series. I hope I hope it's been helpful, even if you're not planning on building this kit. Um, I hope there's been some things that I've gone over during uh, this series that have been helpful. Uh, to you that may spark some ideas that you can do on other models. Um, that's that's really what this is all about, is not so much about a specific model, but just exploring different ways to do things, and, and all of it with the goal of having fun. So 
I hope that's come through in this, and I hope it's been useful to you in some way. If you've not already done so, please hit the subscribe link down over here somewhere and uh, hit the little bell icon so you'll know when, uh, when new videos come out. And I would be really grateful if you would uh, give this video a like just down below and drop a comment. Um, one, I like to hear from people. And I always enjoy hearing when, uh, when they've found the work that I do helpful. Uh, useful, entertaining, or maybe just a way to drift off to a nice nap. Um, but it also helps me grow the channel, which I'm trying to do. Uh, so I'd be grateful if you would uh, do those. There's also links down below to Patreon if you would like to support the work that I do. Uh, I would be most grateful if you would check that link out. If you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so much. Um, you, What you do for me makes what I do possible. We just couldn't afford to do this uh, otherwise uh, at the pace that I do it with the materials and the kits and the things that I do it with uh, if it weren't for you. So thank you so very much for supporting the work that I do. And with all that being said, I'll leave you with one final thought as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.